Um, Uh, right, so before the break, uh, I mentioned this main lemma. I'm, I'm rewriting it now in slightly different form. Uh, now we have more memory, so we can learn. Uh, so, okay, so this, this just recalls some of these following definition. What do we mean by accurate? And in, in case you want to uh, look at that. But let's focus now on the main lemma. So we call what we have. We had this uh, collection of edges. Each one had its own subspace or, or a system of linear equation. And we knew that like condition passing through each of these edges, we are like uniform over this subspace. Now the question is, can we sort of uh, partition it into a uh, few groups where each has like its own set of equations that accurately uh, captures the knowledge? And we said that we have this dichotomy. So we look at this w, which will be a random variable, taking values, and the values will be affine subspaces of f2 to the n. So this is like uh, this, uh, these edges. So think of it as if you condition on reaching here, then you have some distribution over the edges, and this gives you like a distribution over subspaces. Okay, so think of this w as a random variable. And now I'm going to assume that there is no equation that is shared by most of these, by a large fraction of this subspace. So for each equation, for each a, b, the probability is that the equation is satisfied by the subspace, okay? So the, this is exactly saying that every x in the subspace satisfies the equation. This happens with probability at most epsilon. So when, whatever equation you're looking at here, it is shared by at most epsilon of the edges, epsilon fraction of them. <coughs> Then I want to show that the distribution is actually close to the uniform distribution. What is this distribution? So you can think of it as first sampling w and then sampling a point in w. I want to show that this distribution is close to the uniform distribution over all possible strings. And the proof would be uh, not too difficult, actually. It would be a, a simple Fourier analytical proof. Uh, the, we have two proofs. So the first proof that Rand gave shows that the, the distance, the statistical distance between this distribution and the uniform is at most epsilon, okay, this parameter, times 2 to the n over 2. It seems a little bit big. 2 to the n over 2 is pretty big. So you need to pick your epsilon to be smaller than that, like 2 to the minus, so you can pick epsilon to be 2 to the minus 0 0.6 and in order for this to work. <coughs> This will be not good enough for the sparse case. And we will need the, the strengthening that this closeness is at most square root of epsilon times 2 to the k. Okay, so if you think of the sparse case, k, k is roughly log n. So this is much better than this. OK, so this is what we, we will show. And this would be actually a sim, uh, quite simple proof. So I, I need to say that in the sparse case, we are not really talking about the uniform distribution. We are talking about the uniform distribution of our sparse solution. So there is more difficulty in proving it. But I will not go into these technical issues. Uh, so what was the W that we were, we were applying it to? So think of, of uh, like condition on this reaching to this vertex V. It gives you some distribution over these edges. Okay. And then it gives you some distribution over subspaces. But this. But this is general, any, any, any distribution. Actually, we don't, we don't care how this distribution is. So any distribution over subspaces, as long as the co-dimension is at most k, satisfies this property. So, yes? Um, so if you, you ask for the, for the um, combination of the distributions, whether there's an a, a inner product that's biased, then if, there, if any inner product that's biased has to be in at least an ep that's epsilon biased has to be in a, at least an epsilon fraction. Right. Um, so the, so the, it's one from the going from uh, epsilon bias to, to exactly. L1. Exactly. So what you are, uh, what the, the proof 
Russell already gave the proof for one. <laughs> so basically, the first condition gives us uh, some bound on the Fourier coefficient of this, of this distribution. And this is bound is, is strong enough to prove this. Uh, <coughs> basically, it's called Vazirani XOR lemma. Yeah. If you know that you have a distribution and, and all the parity functions are very close to being uniform, then the distribution is close to being uniform. So, I always, I think in the original Vazirani, you had like 2 to the n rather than 2 to the n over exactly. 2. So I just didn't understand the over 2. <coughs> Maybe you see it. <laughs> but, uh, but it is different. Because no, I, I think that uh, this is exactly the one I need Solema, so I would be surprised. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it is different, right? Because usually the, the way it's usually stated is that the expected, uh, the expect, okay, the probability for a random x in w to, yeah. right. to satisfy the most epsilon. So right. there is something different here. Right. But it, yeah, but it follows from this idea. Okay. Uh, okay. So in order to prove this, I, I want to introduce a, a Russell already introduced this, but let's let's uh, do it uh, now again. So I want to take a function on the Boolean cube. So it takes strings and gives us some numbers, and I want to represent it in the Fourier domain. So I want to represent it. Uh, uh, the Fourier transform of this function. So you can write it uniquely in this form. You sum over all strings alpha and 0, 1 to the n. You have a coefficient for each string. We call it the Fourier coefficient. And we multiply by this minus 1 to the, to the parity function. So minus 1 to the inner product of alpha and x. This representation is unique. If you look at things differently, it's, it looks like a multilinear polynomial, but it takes this notion. You can actually calculate the coefficient by taking the inner product of your function with the parity function. So this is the expectation under the uniform distribution. <coughs> uh, OK, so one useful uh, equality is that basically these parity functions are not orthonormal basis. So you get that the inner product of f with itself, or the expected of f squared, equals to the sum of squares. If, if uh, the output of the function was plus minus 1, this equals one also, but we would not be in this situation. Uh, okay, so now we, we are talking about distributions, right? So what, how do we associate a function with distribution? We would simply think of the, the, func the, the function that takes an, as input the string and outputs the probability that this string is sampled according to the distribution. Okay, so in particular, like, what would be the function associated with the uniform distribution? Will be the constant function that outputs always two to the minus n. Okay. Okay. So what do we know? You know that it's a distribution. So we know the sum equals one. So in, per in particular, what does this tell us? It tells us that uh, the Fourier coefficient of, of the zero <coughs> vector is two to the minus n, and all the other Fourier coefficient would be smaller than that, actually. So, so there is some normalization factor here, which is a little bit annoying, but. We will work with this uh, definition. Now let's look at the Fourier coefficient of, of a uniform distribution over a subspace. So th this is a very simple distribution in, in terms of the Fourier spectrum. What do we have here? So let's look at the, f so we have some subspace. Think of it now f as a fixed subspace. And we look at the Fourier coefficient of a, of a, of a string alpha. If this string is uh, orthogonal to this subspace, meaning that every equation in the subspace every uh, x in the subspace satisfies this equation, alpha x equals b. Then we'll always have like minus 1 to the b, and we'll take expectation over this thing, and so we'll have, uh, sorry, we'll have, but yeah. Then we take expectation, and we have this normalization factor, so sorry, so here it would be 2 to the minus. Okay. And if it is not, if this is not the case, then we'll have that half of them are ones and half of them are minus ones, so they will cancel each other out and this would be zero. Okay. And now I want to look at what is the Fourier coefficient of D. Right? So we call what is this D? We are taking expectation over W and then taking the uniform distribution over W. So this is the same as the expectation over X of D of x minus 1 to the alpha x. This 
this is the same as expectation over W, expectation over F. U W of X. Okay, now let's change the order of summation. <coughs> You already did change your... Ah, sorry. Yeah, I already did. Okay, so this is uh, exactly the Fourier coefficient of W. Alpha. Right, and what do we know? So we know that for a particular alpha, only epsilon fraction of them has this thing, and all the rest have zero. So this would be at most, at an absolute value, at most epsilon times two to the minus seven. Okay. Whenever alpha is orthogonal to w, we would have two to the minus n. Whenever it's not, we would have zero. Okay. This is. I'm not doing anything. Uh, yeah. So I could you explain again uh, the first property of U W of the full coefficient of uh, uh, U W? I mean, why is it minus one to the b to the two minus n times two to the minus n? Mm -hmm. Whenever everything in X satisfy this equation, mm -hmm. then we basically take the expectation mm -hmm. over X sampled according to U W of minus one to the a. Right, this is a Fourier coefficient. Mm -hmm. More or less, maybe up to two to the minus n. So it should be minus. No, no there's the two minus to the minus n is in the expectation because that's over the uniform distribution, not over u w, but over. Uh, right. Yeah. It's okay. Over the full spins. Right, but I, I want to say that you can also write it with this. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, maybe something like this. Maybe okay. Maybe the normalization factors that I get are wrong, but. Something similar to this, so, so basically you get here that if this equation holds for the subspace, then it's always the same sign times the normalization factor, which works out. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, uh, then it's zero. But why is it sufficient to have even one x that is, uh, I mean, I would expect that if there is, say, only one x that does not satisfy the distribution, then I would get Maybe less, but uh, not so zero. Why is it zero in the other case? Yeah. It's zero in the other case because everything is a subspace, right? So oh. if if you're a subspace, then oh. either all of them satisfy it or half of them satisfy it. Oh, okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah. So me, maybe I, yeah, I should have said that. Okay. So now, okay. So what does it tell us? It tells us that we know this bound on all all Fourier coefficient of this distribution. And now, uh, the two conclusions will be sp uh, fairly simple from this. Okay. <coughs> so, Vazirani XOR lemma, uh, <coughs> as I said, uh, if you look at the, the distribution U in the uniform distribution, and you look at the L1 distance between the two, okay, which is up to a constant the same as statistical distance. And you look at it squared. This would be a little bit nicer to work with. And this is at most the sum over the, the Fourier coefficient square of, of D. I'm only taking here the non-empty, non-zero Fourier coefficients. Because I have some normalization factor, I have here 2 to the 2n. Okay, so this is uh, fairly simple. You can uh, try to do it but on your own. It's basically applying cauchy schwarz and then applying Parseval. So it's really simple to go from here to here. This is sometimes uh, called Vazirani exolema. And then. Okay, so, so now I want to get one and two, so, right, so I have these two bounds. So how do I get the first bound? I simply know that each one of them is smaller than uh, epsilon squared to the minus two n. Okay, so then I get that this entire thing is at most 
some graph of x plus squared minus 2n comes to be 2n. I'm summing here 2 to the n minus 1 of us. Right? So this is at most epsilon squared times 2 to the n, and then I take the square root. Does this look familiar? Okay. And in the second case, well, I'm not going to do something too complicated, so I'm just going to bound the sum of squares by, okay, so I'm bounding the sum of squares by the maximal value. Okay, so this is over non-zero. So I'm just taking the maximal uh, coefficient here times the sum of absolute values. This is at most epsilon times 2 to the minus n. And I claim that because d is a sort of a convex combination over subspaces, each of co-dimension k, and I claim that this is at most 2 to the k times 2 to the minus n. Okay, so, so I still need to show this. But let's say that I did, then plugging this here would give me so let's call this star. It will give me that star is at most 2 to the k times epsilon. Then I take square root and I get exactly. So I just need to show this. And this is simple. Right? So, so let's, let's look at this maybe. Right, so let's sum here over all alphas. of expectation. Okay. And I'm using the fact that all these subspaces had co-dimension k. So the number of alphas that get non-zero coefficient is at most 2 to the k. Okay, so, so each one of them is bounded by 2 to the k times 2 to the minus n, so, so hence this thing is This is the bound. I think this actually simplifies what is written in the paper currently. Yeah, so in the first part, we used k equal to n, is it? Uh, uh, right. So in order to, to, to make this uh, effective, we, use we sort of needed epsilon to be really, really tiny, and then we, we needed k to be pretty large. And for the sparse case, the first thing is not uh, sufficient. Mm -hmm. So, so these two bonds are incompatible. Do you think there is a... Uh... Yeah, so, right, so it's not clear, right? So this could be better if epsilon is smaller than this is actually. <coughs> I mean, basically, we are bounding the sum of squares, so you can just bound the OK, so, so this more or less finishes the proof of the main lemma. And from the main lemma, we have the regrouping. So basically, we, we, we've have highlighted how we ca can take a branching program, convert it into an affine branching program. Yes? Can I, you need to condition on you want the uniform distributions on k sparse. Yeah, for the sparse case, it's much more complicated. They sort of hide things under the rug. So, so this is under the uniform distribution. This is for the general uh, <coughs> parity learning problem, not for the sparse case. For the sparse case, I need to take the intersection, like the uniform distribution of sparse solution to, to the equations. This gives us some, some difficulties. But would the statement of the lemma change in this case? Uh, morally, no. You'll need, for example, that 
sort of these uh, subspaces would be sort of pseudo-random, and it, it, you can satisfy it by saying that the subspaces are actually um, performed by seeing the equations, and the equations are random, so the subspaces would have this property. So that's that's what you have. Okay. So I want to uh, now highlight the lower bounds on the affine model, which are somewhat uh, simpler. And, and this also would reveal us the strategy for the general case, how we take it from the parity learning case to the uh, general learning mod, uh, problems that do not involve parities. Okay. So. so actually, uh, in the in this conversion process that you have, you're not relying on the fact that in the I minus one layer you have few no. uh, vertices. You're just relying on the fact that they are all sort of classified as accurate. Right. Exactly. I think that yeah, what is uh, we talk with, talk with Amir. So what's surprising about this lemma is that it's true. <laughs> <laughs> the proof is simple, but. Uh, in the using the first one, you could like set your initial epsilon to be about two to the negative n squared or something like that, and then okay, you but then it would be bad for the partitioning, right? Almost, you have, you said it's going to be like two to the negative k squared or. So I, what I pick, I pick, I would pick epsilon to be two to the min minus let's say a hundred times k. Yeah. And this would give us some bound. Uh, they would be close in some statistical distance. And then this would tell me that I have a f that either I have a fraction of 2 to the minus OK of, of the oh. probability mass that share an equation, or we are close to the uniform distribution. And then to get to the subspace, I need to sort of like reveal K equations. And this would give me a fraction which is 2 to the minus order K raised to the power k, because I'm sort of, I will repeat it recursively uh, until I discover k equations. And so that's why I get the two to minus order k. So you just pretend that the, that the representation by the vector space is perfect, yeah. and then you just like, like do a union yeah. bound over things you've, you've made a mistake it's, it's on. A, it's a lot more tricky than how I, Present it here. Yeah, it's it's complicated a bit to go to actually make it work. Uh, like the naive first, like the first attempt that you would do would some somehow the, the error would not accumulate additively, and you need to do a more careful analysis. So this is the, the, the perhaps the most trickiest part in the paper. Uh, yeah. OK, so I want to, to, to show lower bounds on this affine model. OK, so I have this branching program. And I want to show that in order to be successful, in order to learn k equations, I must be uh, wide. OK, so let's say that I fix the, the length. So I fix the number of samples to be m. Think of m as like maybe slightly less than an exponential in n for the general case. And in order to show that this should be wide, I look at a particular vertex V that, learn, that has like k equations here. Now, we will show that the probability of reaching V is extremely small. We show this it's most m to the k times two to the minus k times m minus minus two k. Okay, so, so this would be actually uh, a lot smaller than, than than the inverse of this. So, so really think of this thing. So it's we mean the probability of reaching a particular vertex would be exponentially small in something like k times m. And as we said, in order to succeed, we must reach of such a vertex. So it means that in order to succeed, the number of vertices should be at least inverse of that. So this shows that success means that the 
Yeah, over everything. Yeah. everything. Okay, so success means that the number of uh, nodes here in this graph would be at least like 2 to the k and then it's 2k divided by m choose k and then the width should be at least this divided by m. Okay, so then the width Okay, so, 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 so this is the, the main idea, to do some kind of union bound, to say that for, for each, so think of it as in the parity case. You look at a particular set of equations, let's say n over 10 linear equations. You ask yourself, what is the probability that during the, the running of the learning algorithm, we would come up with this set of equations? It will show that this is exponentially small in n squared. This way we can show uh, the, the lower bound. So how can we show that? Uh, so the nice thing is that now we are focusing on one vertex. So we have a, the system of equations, and we know that we want to learn these equations. But in order to learn something, we must See, see this equation, or we must see uh, like a linear combination of these equations. So, so this is what would help us. Okay, so we have this v, which is a fixed vertex. We have L of v, which is a system of, let's say, k equations. Okay, linearly independent equations. to be in the span of what we see? Right, right. right. Because I, I mentioned two properties. One is the soundness. Like yeah. I don't want to, to write bound equations that I haven't seen or, or inferred from the input. And, this, and the second is accuracy. So I'm going to use the soundness now. OK, so, so we call that we have this uh, random uh, uh, random uh, variables which correspond to the computation path. The vertex at, at layer 0, 1, up to m. I want to look at Li, it will be uh, just the system of equations on v. Okay. And I want to look at the following progress measure. Zi, which would be a random variable, would be the dimension of the span of Li intersection with the span of Lv. We are basically like how many equations are shared by what I have currently and what I'm aiming to, to reach. Okay, so we are starting with Z0 equals 0, right? But in the beginning, we don't remember anything. And in order to succeed, we want Zm to be k. So basically, we'll show that the probability that Zm equals k is this, this number. It's very small. How do we show that? So in order to get, OK, so, so, so let's see how does this uh, random variable progresses. So what can we do in the branching program? We can learn a new equation. We cannot learn more than one equation, because we just see one equation. We can forget stuff. And these are the only, like, basically, two things that we can do. And we can, uh, well, basically, everything is close to the span. So right, if I know like two equations, I also know like the, their sum. So I can work with uh, some spaces. So, so I, by what I said, the soundness, the fact that I, I remember only things that I've seen and I can infer, you can see that zi is always at most the previous values that it got plus one. But you, like you cannot learn more than one equation instead. So basically, we would want to sh uh, show that like, the event that it actually grows is, happens with very small probability. Okay, so let's see. 
like this is the case. Say that the probability that zi is bigger than zi minus one. Okay, I want to condition on everything that happens in the first, like the history of the first i minus one steps. So I want to sort of like uh, show it no matter what I did in the first i minus one steps. So I just want to show that this, that this is small. So let's say that I fixed the history. So I already got to a, a specific, like I fixed x and I fix the history, like a1 up to a i minus one. So it means that I reached to a particular vertex in the i minus one layer. Okay. And now I ask whether or not in the next layer I learned a new equation that is so somehow uh, in, the, in this intersection that is in LV. Okay, so in order for this to happen, I must have that, so for Zi to be greater, well, greater than Zi minus one, I must have that this equation that I see in the i step should be in the span of L V i minus one, or sorry, L i minus one union LV. So this is a small uh, thing to check. Uh, it's basically, okay, it takes like two lines to, to show that. So the only way that you, you could increase the dimension is if this equation set on the span of what you learned so far and what you're trying to get to. And how does it help us? Well, we assume that everything has co-dimension at most k, so the number of equations is at most k in each thing. So this means that the dimension of this guy is at most k. The same goes for this guy. So this is a set of size 2 to the 2k at most. And AI was selected uniformly at random condition on everything that happened up to this stage. So this happens with probability that this probability is smaller then this, uh, this number of possibilities divided by 2 to the n. Now how do we prove this thing? So in order to get to k, we need to have at least k indices where we increase the value of zi. Right, so the probability is that zm equals a k is at most like a union bound over like, like k tuples. I want that, that in step i1, I increase the, the z. And in step i2, I increase the z. So I want zi j for all j's to be greater than z i j minus 1. And now I can write this as like uh, the probability that the first event happened times the probability that the second event happened, condition on the first event happened. So on and so forth, and each time I'm having like something like this condition on some history. So this would be at most this thing. Where here I have okay, two to the two k divided by two to the n raised to the power k. And how many tuples do I have? M to the k at most. So I have the bound that I want. Okay, so this finishes the proof. Uh, and I want, yeah. I want to, to, to recall this intuition that we had. Why is it hard to learn spar parities? Because we, at some point in the computation, at least in this model, we must learn, let's say, n over five equations. In order to store them, it requires us something like n squared memory bits, omega n squared memory bits. We can prove it sort of by saying that you know, it's not like you can uh, say, I want to learn this set of, of n over five linear equations, because then you would uh, find them in your stream of example with very, very small probability. 
So you cannot sort of like uh, wait for the right equation to arrive. Uh, okay, so I think this this is a good uh, a good place to go to the to the second part, which is about uh, results on uh, general uh, learning problems. Okay, so I'm going to use the slides again. So it seems that everything that we did so far was very tailored towards parity learning, right? We talked about Fourier coefficients, subspaces, linear equations. It's not clear how to generalize this to, to other problems. So one way is we can do reductions, as we did with sparse case and DNFs. But this is limited. So we want a, a more general framework and a more general proof. And so, so they po you pose this question, can you generalize the proof for for problem not involving parity, and then this line of work of Raz and Moshkowitz and Moshkowitz shows that indeed you can. <coughs> so you get a new and general proof techniques that work for uh, a wider variety of learning problems. We will focus uh, on Raz's proof technique, but there are similarities between them. As a special case, you get a new proof which looks that looks different for the uh, parity learning case. Uh, so you can show in this new, new proof technique lower bounds that the memory is at least quadratic or that the time is at least the number of samples is at least exponential. Surprisingly, these results did not achieve uh, the lower bounds that we knew on sparse parities, even though they were after this paper. But we, we managed to, to handle this issue and to, to generalize them even further. You know, work with Sumega and Ran, and independently of us, uh, Paul, Shayan, and, and Yang showed uh, uh, essentially the same result. And, and these results actually unify all, all the results. So you can get parity learning, sparse parity learning, and more. And we will see some new applications using this proof technique. OK. So how do we even address the, the question? So I want to, to view the learning problem now as a matrix. So I will have a matrix. The rows would be just a finite set A. The columns would be a finite set X. What would the row correspond? All possible samples that I could see. And the columns would correspond to all possible functions that I'm trying to learn. OK? So this is a huge matrix. So if you think of parity learning, it's a 2 by n by 2 by n matrix. At, at entry, uh, like small a, small x, I just put the value of the function x on the input a. Okay, so this is how I encode this as a matrix. And now what is the learning problem associated with a matrix? You pick a column uniformly at random, and then you pick rows, you start picking rows uniformly at random, a1, a2, so on and so forth, and you give me the value of the index of the row and the value of the entry in the matrix. OK, so, so the learner gets to see this sequence of a1, b1, a2, b2, a3, b3, and he eventually needs to learn x. OK, so let's see as an example what will be the matrix associated with the parity learning. So this is a well-known matrix. Let's see. Right. So it's the Adamard matrix. <coughs> right. So I have your x and a. Right, so x. Think of it as a function. So, so basically, it's like before we had x. We have a, and then here we have the inner product of a and x, but we are choosing now to go to the plus minus one notation. So basically, we'll take minus one to raise to. Okay, so this is the Hadamard matrix, the, and we know we love and we love this matrix. We know a lot about this uh, matrix. We know that uh, that it's a, an extractor with reasonably good parameters, and we will use this uh, property. 
And this, this matrix is analyzed in a lot of uh, computational models. Okay. So I want to state the result with Sumega and RAN. This is a result in the language of extractors. So we show that if this matrix for, has some extractor property, and I, I'm explicitly saying what the property is. So the property is that any big enough submatrix is unbiased. Okay, so if you take at least 2 to the minus k fraction of the rows, and at least 2 to the minus l fraction of the columns, then here the number of ones would be very similar to the number of minus ones. Namely, the difference between them as a fraction of this size would be at most 2 to the minus r. Say that you have this, then you can prove lower bounds on the memory, which is k times l, or on the number of sample, which is exponential in r. In particular, think of the inner, like the Hadamard matrix. We know that you can pick k, l, and r to be linear in n, maybe like n over 4 or something. So then you get quadratic memory or exponential space. And also for the sparse parity ca uh, case, we can sort of uh, express it in this language. As I said, independently, this result uh, was proved by, by in this work. Uh, the language is very different, but you can actually translate between them and see that there are a lot of similarities between the result, and the proof is very similar. So let's mention a few applications of this new, of this new technique. So first, we have the previous application. We can learn parties, and we can learn sparse parties, which, which actually was not done in, the, in, in the, some of these previous works. We cannot learn parties, and we cannot learn sparse parties. We cannot learn parties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we know. <laughs> we can prove lower bounds for Yeah, so. And I want to mention these two new applications. So let's focus on the last, on this fourth one. Learning low degree polynomials. Okay, so, so we talked about party learning, which is like learning a linear function. What if we generalize it to degree two function, degree d function? Okay, so the learner tries to learn a polynomial, a multilinear polynomial of degree at most d over, let's say, f2. And he gets to see ran random points. So he gets to see random x's and the value of, of the polynomial on x. Sorry, random A's, because uh, the samples are you know, the samples by A. So you get to see random A's and P of A. So we claim that any learner for this model requires either a memory n to the d plus 1 or 2 to the n number of samples. And basically, you can also do it by the Occam razor. So basically, you can just store uh, n to the d equations and sort of like figure out what is the right polynomial. So you, you can also do it efficiently with n to the d plus 1 memory. If you want a little bit less than that, you'll need exponential number of sum. What is this third uh, learning problem? It's very similar to this one, but there is a, a difference. So I have a vector x of length n, and I get to see a, a random polynomial of degree d and the value of the po this polynomial on x. And I get to see a lot of them, a lot of po different polynomials. So it's also a generalization of, of learning sparse parities. If you think about it, what's the relation between these two things? Yeah, so, the so it's the transpose of the matrix, exactly. And as you, as you recall, our bound was based on the fact that the matrix is an extractor. If a matrix is an extractor, also the transpose is an extractor. So that's why, using our technique, the low ones that we get are the same for any learning program and the transpose of the learning problem. And I think it's sometimes like a, a very useful thing to think of, like the transpose, like thinking of the inputs as a function instead of the, fu you know. Like. So is this how you got here? You had uh, crypto result where you said the key lengths are large. Exactly. Right. So actually, before this proof, we couldn't prove uh, the crypto result. Uh, we couldn't prove that if you have this uh, parity case, which is the transpose of the sparse parity case. So in the sparse parity case, what do we know? We know that x is sparse and a's are random. So what if x was uh, random and a's were sparse? 
Right? So this is like learning from uh, sparse equations, right? And we could not prove it in the, the previous framework, but now, since we have this characterization, we can prove everything in this framework. We also get it for the transport, and henceforth, we get the result in the crypto. So as I mentioned before, we get uh, a scheme that you need to spend something like L time steps per in, uh, for encoding one bit, and it is secure against a learner or attacker that has uh, less than N times L memory bits. Does the fact that the learning problem is hard imply that the matrix is an extractor? Uh, excellent question. I'm not sure. Uh, probably uh, not literally, but maybe that there is a sub matrix which is an extractor. But I'm also not sure about that. So, uh, yeah, so this is one of the open questions that I want to mention. So, is this actually characterized the, the problem? Is this a characterization of the uh, time space hardness of the problem? So, I'm not sure. Okay. How can we show that, uh, what is the, 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 the most useful techniques in order to show that something is an extractor? This is actually how we prove all our, all our uh, applications are proved in this way. So this is uh, well known and was uh, previously studied. In order to show that something is an extractor, it's enough to show that like, the columns are nearly orthogonal to one another. Okay? So we have this notion of epsilon delta almost orthogonal. We want every column to be almost orthogonal to it, uh, to all but the delta fraction of the other columns. Okay, so so for every column, at most delta fraction of the other columns, have inner product at most epsilon with with this column. This basically uh, captures this notion. We can show it for low degree polynomials and sparse parities and so on and so forth. And that's how we get the result. And the result is this thing. If you have a matrix which has this epsilon delta almost orthogonal columns, then learning requires either log one over epsilon, log one over delta memory bits, or poly one over epsilon number of samples. Okay, and basically for, let's say for parity learning, you can prove it with epsilon delta which are exponentially small. So just uh, like very briefly, some ideas from the proof. Is yes. there a way of interpreting the fact that this matrix for low degree polynomials is an extractor at, as a statement just in terms of low degree polynomials? Does it say something about the sets of zero or the image of a low degree so, polynomial? So basically we used a result of uh, Lovett, Ben Eliezer, and Odd. It basically tells you that like... Uh, like correlation. Right? Yeah, correlation bounds on, on low degree polynomials. So, so basically translate directly to this notion of epsilon delta. Yeah, so you can ask yourself this question. It's a very interesting question on its own. And I think uh, Paul et al. Uh, showed it also for a uh, lot of weak problems over any field. Right. Okay, so again, the model will be the same as before, the branching program model. The main difference is that we would not have this conversion. We are not simulating anything. We would just prove it in this model. Uh, so again, uh, any vertex V needs to come up with uh, an hypothesis, what is the value of X, and we want to show that it doesn't succeed with uh, this improbability. We can also show here that uh, weak learning is, uh, is also impossible, um, yeah, so we, which is sort of stand, uh, straightforward from our proof. Okay, so again, we look at this distribution of X condition on V. And again, we will do this union bound. We will look at a particular vertex V that we call a significant vertex. How do we define significant vertex? Previously, we talked about vertices that remember K equations. Now we don't have equations anymore, so we need to somehow do it only with respect to this distribution. So what we want is we want the norm, the L2 norm of this distribution to be big. Okay, so the L2 norm of the uniform distribution is exponentially <coughs> small in n. We want it to be 2 to the L bigger than that. Intuitively, what does it capture? It captures that we know like L bits of information on X, but in the L2 norm, not in the entropy. Okay, and L2 is easier to work with in this case. 
And again, what we will show, we will show that for each particular vertex, the probability of reaching to this specific vertex is exponentially small in k times l, or n squared if you think of it. And again, if we want to learn, we must reach a significant vertex. Because if we haven't reached a significant vertex, so basically our distribution is sort of spread around on so many x's that I cannot tell which one is the right one. So I will fail. So I must, in order to succeed, I must reach a significant vertex. That's my that intuitive claim. OK, and there is some complication. So we cannot really show it on the computational path. We need to somehow change it. So, so in the parity learning case, we already have, always have these conditions that we can learn at most one equation. In general learning problems, maybe we, we see something very rare that gives us a lot of information on x. So this is a little bit tricky, but we can somehow say that this doesn't happen. Like it happens with very small probability, and we take like uh, this is an event that is global. It, it's not with respect to a particular vertex v, it's on the computational path. So we show that basically you can assume that nothing atypical is happening. You can sort of forget about that. So what we want to show is we want to show this thing. And basically, the proof sort of will go along as the proof of the affine branching programs. We will have some progress measure that will start small, grow slowly, and that in order to, to, uh, to get to V, it should be big in the end. Okay, so this is just a strategy. So what is this progress measure? So again, recall that we have the vertex at layer i, vi. And we can look at the distribution of x condition on this vertex. We can look also at the distribution of x condition, like the specific vertex that we are looking at currently, the significant vertex that we are trying to reach to. We are measuring the, the, the inner, like the, we take the inner product of these two uh, distributions. I want you to, 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 to think this is really capturing, in, in the Affan case, this intersection of the linear equations. And in some sense, it captures how much these things are close together. Actually, it's, it's literally the same. If, if this were only alpha and subspaces, then this would some, somehow measure the size of the intersection of their uh, linear equations. We define them. So this is uh, really the same as before. The weird thing is that we raise it to the power k. And the, way, the, the reason that we do it is that uh, otherwise we would get only linear bounds on the memory. In this way, we get quadratic bounds. So this is uh, slightly weird, but uh, basically, we raise it to the, the, the highest power such that this measure progress would not explode. So we pick, we pick the highest power so that this behaves well, and k turns out to be the answer. OK, so let's show these three bullets. So what is the value of this progress function in the beginning? What, what, what do we have in the beginning? In the beginning, we don't know nothing about x. So this is really the uniform distribution. The inner product of any distribution with the uniform distribution is exponentially small in n. Is it 2 to the minus n exactly. So we get it here, this thing. The second step is a complicated step. We need to show that zi grows slowly. This is similar to, how, to what we did in the Affine case, where we showed that it's hard to learn a new equation. Okay. Because we needed to learn a specific equation. And here also, we need to come closer to a specific uh, distribution. So this is where the hard part is. The third bullet is, all, is, all, is simple. right? So let's say that what is this progress measure on the last layer? It's at least the probability of reaching this vertex v times how much it con contributes to this expectation. Right? So here we have, let's say, uh, that we replace vm with v. Then this is really the inner product of px condition of v with itself. And we know that v is significant. So we know that this inner product is at least 2 to the l times 2 to the minus k. And we raise it, sorry, 2 to the minus n. And we raise it to the power k. So this is why we get the third bullet. Main difficulty is showing the, the second bullet, but uh, at least, and, and this is something that I realized just preparing for this talk, that it follows like the same structure as the affine branching program. Yes. And you can view it as, actually, the progress function is not so far 
of, of what you have in the offense scheme. It's not splitting vertices. What? Not I'm not splitting vertices. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's like generalizing the easy part of the yes. And actually, this proof is shorter. OK, so I want to finish with some open problems. Uh, OK, so some were already mentioned. So we, uh, I was already asked here whether or not we get the optimal trade-off for DNFs, the decision trees, and juntas. So we got a, a, a super linear low bound in the memory. But the other <coughs> one is quadratic, so it's not clear what the right answer is. And it's not even clear what are the limits of the extractor-based methods for this program. Problems. Uh, in particular, you can ask yourself what is the best extractor that you can build where each row, sorry, each column is, a, let's say, a decision tree or a DNF. Can you build extractors with good parameters? If, if so, then you prove the, these low bounds. Um, okay. What Madhu was asking is whether or not uh, like there's an if and only if. Okay, so we said that if it's an extractor, you cannot learn. If it's not an extractor, can you learn? So maybe there is a submetrix which is an extractor, so you cannot learn the submetrix. So, so maybe let's say that every submetrix is not an extractor. Can you learn? I'm not sure. And more generally, you can ask uh, to characterize combinatorially uh, when is uh, uh, efficient learning can be done with, with small space uh, based on properties of these metrics. Very interesting open question is to generalize our techniques to the real value domain. So we can generalize it actually to any finite domain. We can generalize it to a, a finite output. So we, we don't need necessarily need to, to think of output in just one bit. So we can uh, look at things that uh, work maybe over big finite fields or stuff like that. But we don't know how to do it for the reals. Maybe we don't know how to do this union bound. Right? So, uh, and another interesting question is to generalize it for a model where that looks at the uh, stream more than once. So in streaming, it's a very uh, standard model to, to maybe do k passes on the stream. Our log bounds do not hold for that. One thing that we use is the fact that the next sample is always fresh randomness. If we are uh, looking at it again and again, so maybe we remember some of the samples and then things behave uh, differently. So we have some uh, work in progress that we are able to get something for two pass, but currently not for k pass. And what we get is even, uh, uh, it's not tight even for the parity learning. Okay? So there's still a lot of work to be done here. Let me just finish with one problem that I want to emphasize. Uh, this is uh, related to uh, neural networks, uh, which is a very hot topic now. Uh, and I heard this talk of, uh, of Shai Shalev Schwartz, and he, 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 he basically pointed out that there is a difference between expressiveness and learnability uh, in neural networks. And he, poses, he, he, he explained about a particular experiment. You take a neural network, uh, let's say depth to neural network, and you generate from it examples. So you so you sample random inputs and feed them to the network and take the output. So now you have a stream of examples. Now you feed it to the same neural network with the same architecture. So it can obviously, like, in terms of express expressiveness, it could express it accurately with error zero. But it, uh, the new, the, new uh, the learner does not know the weights. So it knows the architecture, it doesn't know the weights. And it needs to learn the weights and it's doing stochastic garden descent and he is not able to learn the weights, and he is not even able to predict the outcome. Okay, so the, the error is pretty big, like in most setting of parameters. So I wonder whether or not this could be explained by the fact that the learner has a small amount of memory. So if you think of a stochastic gradient descent, basically the learner only stores its current guess for the weights. So it's like linear in the description of the the neural network, perhaps we can show that uh, it's impossible to learn in li linear space uh, this class of function. So this is uh, something that, that 
it's a work in progress, so we still cannot do it. If you have some ideas, I would be happy to hear. Uh, I guess I'll finish with that. Thank you. the lower bond carries from the matrix from to the transfer. Do you think upper bond also goes that way or other examples? Great question. So yeah, I, I think it would be nice to show that like uh, the, like if you can do it for this learning problem, you can also do it for the transpose. Currently, we only know that the proof technique worked for the transpose, and this is simple to see, but we don't necessarily know how to translate like an algorithm from one to an algorithm to another. Yeah, so this would be very interesting to understand. So <coughs> in learning theory, people like to uh, look at this things like this dimension. Yeah. Do you think there is any kind of relation between this and your? Uh, Okay, so there is something called statistical query dimension, which is very similar to this uh, ortho like epsilon delta orthogonal vectors. So we can also write it in this language. So basically it tells us you that you have like m functions that are have correlation one over m. So there's only like one parameter. So we take two parameters, epsilon and delta. Um, what about different distributions? For example, if the concept comes from a non-uniform distribution or the samples come from a non-uniform? Great question. Uh, so in this work with Sumega and RAN, we actually generalize it to uh, arbitrary distribution. The, the condition is a little bit more complicated. And even the distribution can depend on the function. So you, you can have even a non-product distribution over the metric. So for each column, you would have a different distribution. Over the rows, and some of the results still hold. You say that this opens for real world domains, so for each domain, does it carry on? So, for any finite, uh, we have some results. More questions? Yeah. I'm sorry if it's obvious, but I. Uh, do you have similar results for agnostic learning instead of learning, assuming that the examples actually do not come from uh, the class itself, but from something else? Uh, Is it harder? It seems, it seems harder, right? Uh, and we are pulling out, so I would imagine that it's harder. But I mean, in particular, like uh, the, the samples could be without any noise, like even, and then it will still be at least as hard. Okay, so our result called for weak learning. So we, we show that you cannot even output an hypothesis that uh, even slightly agrees with your function. So I guess that it also works in this setting.